like to take a moment to acknowledge that the land that we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. The City of Toronto also acknowledges that all treaty people, including those who came here as settlers, as migrants either in this generation or in generations past, and those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly those brought to these lands as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. We pay tribute to those ancestors of African origin and descent. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Ward 3 Bluer Complete Street Extension Community Meeting. You'll see an agenda up in front of you. Um, I'm Denise, my last name is long and obnoxious. This is Sweet Dan O'Leary, I'll say it one time, we never have to use it ever again. And I'm going to be your moderator for the event this evening. I work with a company called Wura, and we're a neutral third-party facilitator of meetings just like this. And I'm also a Ward 3 resident. It's my job to act as the traffic director for this evening, uh, ensuring that uh, just a little bit of order so that you can get your voices heard during the question period that will follow just a brief presentation in the beginning. Before I introduce the panelists that are here with you, uh, I want to share with you a little, a few of the ways that you're going to be able to participate in today's event, because we do want to hear your thoughts and your ideas and your questions. That's the whole point of these events. Um, there's two parts this evening, as you can see up on your screen. The first part we're doing right now, the question period. You'll get a brief introduction from the panelists, and then from there there'll be a full hour of questions. We'll follow that up with a feedback session in the cafeteria. It's a little bit of a fun adventure to get to the cafeteria, and so we will have stuff afterwards that will take you to the cafeteria. Um, and there will be lots of opportunities there for you to share your thoughts, speak to city staff, uh, ask questions, and share ideas with us. And then after the event, there's also an opportunity for the team to gather together some of the questions and some of the things that came up in the feedback session, and then share back some of that information with you. So lots of opportunity to uh, connect into this issue. You all got a package of information when you came in the door. Somebody is like me and was like, I love a package. I also love a package. Give it to me all up front so I have it in my hands and I know what's going on. In that information, information package that you got on the way in, you'll find a number of different resources. You'll find the meeting agenda. You'll, share the, you'll find the shared uh, responsibility guide that I'll go through in just a moment with you. You'll find the ward and area context and project area in discussion. You'll find the monitoring and continuous improvements and changes since the installation. You'll find the engagement to date and answers to frequently shared concerns. Some of your questions may already have been answered, so it's, it's worthwhile to sort of check into that package. Um, and have to flip through and see what's there. So um, this is, a, as you can tell, this is a very full room of people, and this is an issue um, where there's a lot of people who have a lot of feelings about this, which is great, that's why we're here. Um, but we also have a shared responsibility to be respectful in this space. Um, so this is a shared responsibility guide. There's a copy of it in your information package. Um, and I'll sort of go through it with you just so that you know what we expect from you and what you can expect from us. As a participant in this event, uh, we ask that you agree to treat others as you would wish to be treated. That means treating all other participants with respect and consideration when they're speaking, being tolerant of a diversity of different views as they're represented in this room and opinions, focusing on critiquing the ideas rather than the individuals, and sharing ideas for change along with the critiques that you might share. Wait for your turn to speak and respect the time limits, which I'll share with you shortly, um, for comments and refrain from disruptive or disrespectful conduct, especially towards others. Um, these will help us move the evening along. Um, the less disruptions means the more questions, and so uh, I will help us to move that along as smoothly as we can. As part of this agreement, we also want to make uh, an agreement with you, things that you can uh, expect from us to ensure mutual respect in the room. We're all here uh, and open to hearing your thoughts and your questions and your comments from all different perspectives. We'll do our best to facilitate fairly, applying the principles and disagreement across the board to all participants. We will do our best to hear from as many people as we possibly can, both in this part of the forum, but also in the activity part uh, later on in the evening. And we'll continue to listen and reflect on your feedback and input, and work to find innovative and collaborative approaches to solving the issues and the concerns in the community. Like I said, I will be a little bit of a traffic director for tonight's event, uh, so we'll talk about how we're going to do that together. If you'd like to ask a question, you'll need to raise your hand, whether you're up in the balcony or on the floor down here. 
There are two folks with mics who will be roving around uh, and will uh, uh, come to you or come close to you to ask your question. Um, I just want you to know that they will be holding on to the mic. And the reason for that is that it helps move things a lot faster. Um, and again, we want to sort of prioritize getting as many questions as we possibly can. So if you're going to be asking a question, then you might want to try and move to the outside of your row. And uh, our friends with the mics, um, I believe we have Zoe on the, on the main floor and Michelle on the upper floor. They're colleagues of mine from Laura. There's lots of you and not a lot of time, so we would love to ask for you to keep your questions and your comments brief. A good rule of thumb is one minute to ask a question, and you can expect a one to two minute response from our panelists. Uh, in this role as, uh, as traffic director, I promise that I will not blow a whistle. It's too much of an enclosed space, though I do love a good whistle. Um, but in order to help keep us on track, I will raise my hand if I think that you're going too long. Um, and if you can't see my hand uh, and it doesn't feel like you're responding to my hand, then I will use my voice to ask you to uh, wrap up your question and move along. And again, this is not because I don't want to hear what you have to say, it's because I want to hear what everybody in the room has to say. Once you've made your comment or you've asked your question, please try not to interrupt the person that's responding to you. Everybody here in this room wants to hear the responses, and if you start talking over the person, it means that people aren't hearing that. If you've asked a question and you have a follow-up question, you are allowed one follow-up question. And if you have more follow-up questions, then we're going to ask you to go back into the speaker's list so that everybody else gets a turn. Um, and uh, we'll move through it that way. We do all this to ensure that everybody has a chance and has space in the room to ask their questions. And if you don't have space in the room to ask your questions, there will be question cards downstairs that you can fill out your questions that the staff team will go through later and, and respond back to you with questions that have been asked. And also there will be the activities in the room that will help you uh, get some of those thoughts and opinions and ideas out in different ways than just an, an open question forum. All good. All right. So now that we know how it's all going to work and how we're going to how we're going to do this together, I'm going to introduce the panel to you, and then we can jump into your questions. Um, I'm going to go through my list, and then I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. So on the panel we have our councillor Amber Morley, City Councillor Ward Three, Etobicoke Lakeshore. We have Barbara Gray, General Manager of Transportation Services for the City of Toronto. We have Jacqueline Hayward, Director of Transportation Project Design and Management, City of Toronto. We have Al Rizowski, Manager, Community Planning, City of Toronto. And we have the Deputy Fire Chief, Jim Jessup, Toronto Fire Services. And I'm going to turn it over to Amber. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, and just confirming we're using this to pass along for the panel. Yeah, great. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. As was mentioned, my name is Amber Morley. I'm very proud and privileged to serve as your representative at City Hall. We're glad to be here in Ward 2 this evening um, in a follow-up to a commitment we made a year ago to have an in-person town hall to discuss this piece of infrastructure in our community. Um, I appreciate you coming, and, and again, as Denise mentioned, we acknowledge this is a very challenging issue and has had a lot of pain points for local residents. We want to hear about those, and we want to continue to work together to address them. I understand um, that we are going to be hearing more, and I, I appreciate uh, my colleagues for joining us here tonight. As promised, when we were through the first phases of this project, going through consultation and um, hearing a lot of feedback, we made a commitment to analyze closely, to be transparent, to be open, and to be collaborative, and we have demonstrated that throughout, and will continue to take that position in that role as the leader for this community. So, um, who's in the room? The next slide is just a little snapshot for all of you. I know sometimes there's concerns about who's joining in for these conversations. And while of course we appreciate that this kind of infrastructure has citywide implications, um, it is a local conversation, a local piece of infrastructure. And so we wanted to, to um, demonstrate uh, where folks are coming from who've registered for tonight's, uh, tonight's session. So that's behind you for your own information. The next thing I just want to talk about is what we're hearing. Um, my team has been deeply engaged in this project, working very closely with Transportation Services and our colleagues at City Hall, um, and hearing from all of you on a very regular basis. Um, so, wanted to just highlight some of the questions and concerns that we've heard, which are around the decision-making and consultation process, um, upcoming changes to the project, which we're really excited to share more about tonight and to uh, continue to monitor the impact of. Um, 
Emergency response times, very importantly, and that's another area that we're excited to have Deputy Chief Jessup joining us to speak to um, as we get into those details. So there's a list here. I'm sure this is um, familiar to all of you, many of whom I'm sure have been in touch uh, with this important feedback to our office. As Denise mentioned, we will be taking questions live from the audience this evening and hear how important it is for all of you to have that opportunity and again, are very happy to be facilitating it. Um, but before we jump into the live question and answer period, we are going to get a brief presentation on updates uh, to the project to date, uh, improvements that have been made, and um, where we go from here. So I will turn it over to Barbara and Jacqueline. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Mayor Morley, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it will be very brief to provide you with a little bit of background on the project so that some of the data questions you may have or, um, or information about the process may be answered in the presentation. It's similar information that's in your package. The Bloor Street West Complete Street Extension Project was approved by Toronto City Council in June of 2023. And it's 4.6 kilometers. We're talking specifically about the section between Runnymede and Bloor West Village and Resurrection Road, uh, linking to six points. Next slide, please. In terms of the, um, the timeline of the project, the first phase of installation um, began in this neighborhood in fall of 2023, which brought the project from Runnymede to Aberfoyle, and then the second phase was installed um, in spring of 2024, as well as some adjustments to that phase one section. We've been continuing to monitor and make some modifications to the project to address both the data that we've collected as well as feedback that we've heard from the community. Um, and so those modifications um, have been made in that time. And we released an interim data uh, update in June of 2024 on our website. Um, and that is, that's publicly available data on many of the accounts and analysis points that we've been collecting. We are continuing to collect more uh, data to be able to understand the way the project is, is uh, operating and improve the way it's operating. We've recently um, completed and have a few more to do of signal retiming to improve signal coordination along the corridor. Um, and then we'll be taking some additional counts in November to be able to get a fall data update published um, so we can see how that performance is going as well. And we have a commitment to continue to make additional upgrades that I'll speak to as well as additional monitoring. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the way that we do monitoring includes the data collection. It also includes regular site visits to observe the way that key intersections are operating in peak periods. Our, the data that we collect is multimodal for number of people biking, number of people driving, as well as understanding the speed that vehicles are traveling, um, both to understand if they're in compliance with the speed limit as well as travel times along the corridor. Um, we are continuing to make adjustments based on those feedback points. Uh, next slide, please. So key points that lots of people like to know about are what are the peak travel time impacts for motor vehicles. And the data that we published in June of 2024 indicated that we have an increase of like, about two and a half to four and a half minutes eastbound <laughs> from the previous conditions. And You're just wasting time and you'll get less questions. So we'll have to stop any time that you do that. We're going to have to stop the proceedings and it means less questions at the end. So I hope that you find a lozenge and we'll continue. So that data is the increase on, on top of the previous travel times and that is particularly seen as a concern between the Kingsway and Jane Street. I point these numbers out to indicate that we aren't satisfied with these numbers and we do want to see those travel times get closer to the precondition and we've had experience in having that be successful in many other projects in the city um, where we've seen travel times get less than a minute um, back close to what the previous conditions were. And so we can make adjustments to achieve that. We have seen improvements in um, speeds along the corridor in terms of closer to the posted speed limit, which along this corridor is 40 kilometers. Um, so we've seen reductions in 17% um, eastbound and westbound, um, to make, making the street safer for uh, everyone. Motor vehicle volumes have decreased less than 1% in both directions, and we've seen bicycle volumes increase on an average about 60%, with stronger increases um, in the... interruptions. So, yeah, we just, we, we're just going to pause any time that there's disruptions because it, it really doesn't help move the process along. So, thanks so much. Proceed. 
So there was a range, depending on the day, of 75 to 750 bikes um, per day along this corridor, with the higher volumes closer to Runnymede, and that range has changed to between 370 to 824. That data is published on our website, and that's a spring 2022 or 23 count compared to a spring 2024 count. And more data will be published in, uh, in the fall. Um, next slide, please. In terms of the post-installation modifications um, that we've been doing, um, in order to improve flow, we've removed right turn on red restrictions. We've made many adjustments to pavement markings and curbs and bollards to improve driveway access and address uh, loading and illegal parking issues. Um, we've also made some revisions to support TTC maneuvers at Armadale, adjustments to accessible and commercial loading zones and laybys for local business needs, um, and minor adjustments to signage as well. Other things that we're working on are improving the loading zone to our, our Lady of Sorrows Church based on feedback we heard from them, um, as well as feedback we heard from Toronto Police around wanting adjustments to barriers facing on the rail underpass area. So that um, is currently underway if it hasn't been done already in the last few days. Um, we are making significant adjustments to the traffic flow. Next slide, please. That's South Kingsway and Bloor, where we see a significant amount of the delay on this corridor. So right now we've made some signal timing upgrades to improve eastbound right turn movements from Bloor down to South Kingsway. And we've been making some pavement marking improvements to the design to increase storage for right turn maneuvers. So we're paying close attention to some of the key intersections in order to see those operate better so that your traffic flow along the corridor can serve everyone um, more, more productively. We have some future considerations underway to improve pedestrian safety uh, at this intersection as well. There is a major development site and we're working closely with them. Um, neighborhood traffic infiltration has also been a concern that we've heard and we are interested to hear your feedback tonight about key locations to ensure that we're collecting data on that. There are many things that we can do um, to address any traffic infiltration that may be experienced. We certainly want to keep those local streets safe. Um, I'll leave it at that for now because I'm sure we'll talk about that in the discussion here or later uh, this evening. Future planned upgrades include a, a sidewalk gap along the Park Lawn Cemetery being filled, um, some small changes to uh, improve pedestrian safety at some key locations where there have been collisions in the past, um, and we'll be having uh, the barriers uh, that will be placed on the Humber River Memical Creek bridges be painted by local artists to improve local beautification. Uh, we are very interested in hearing your feedback both tonight and through the project email, uh, and we'll have many staff downstairs in the session to hear your feedback directly uh, beyond the, what we hear in the questions today. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we do almost have our whole full hour. Thank you for participating in that process. Um, if I could get the house lights on, it would be really helpful so we can see folks. Oh, there you all are. Fabulous. Um, for folks who are standing at the back, there is some space upstairs if you wanted to grab a seat, but we're also happy to have you stand there. And I just want to get, um, where is Zoe and where is Michelle? Oh, I've got Michelle up on the top, and I've got a Zoe... Summer. Okay, we'll start with the top. Um, uh, if you have questions, uh, Michelle is up on the top left. Um, and if you have a question at the bottom, um, we will get, oh, there's a Zoe here. So what we'll do is we'll sort of volley back and forth. We'll take two from the bottom and one from the top. We'll start with the top if anybody up there has a question. If you have a question at the bottom, uh, raise up your hand and Zoe here will, oh, there's this person, the, the third hand back on this side, Zoe was the first hand that I saw. And then Michelle, if you've got a question up there, Oh, can we get that mic up on the top? I support the I support the blue bike lanes and complete streets as a pedestrian, a cyclist, a driver, a customer, and a mother. As a pedestrian, I never felt safe walking on Bloor Street and the Kingsway with my kids prior to the bike lanes being installed. Now we visit Bloor Street as a destination. We appreciate the better pedestrian experience with fewer cars speeding by the sidewalk and the added separation the bike lanes provide between cars and pedestrians. As a cyclist, I appreciate being able to commute safely all year round to my job downtown, to shop on floor, to go to restaurants and friends' houses and take my kids to extracurricular activities. As a driver, I avoid driving on Bloor Street during peak commuting times. But I do drive on Bloor Street. As a customer, when I'm looking for new store or service, a main deciding factor for me is whether I can use a bike lane to get there. As a mother, I appreciate being able to play some small part in the fight against climate change by leaving the car behind whenever possible. And Transformative 
for me and my family. I want to thank city councilors and city staff that made the board by Pennies possible. Thank you. Questions we're going to get. So, and, and I'm actually okay, okay to just wait. Just start off then. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, my name is David. Uh, I do support the bike lanes as well. Uh, I have a very different perspective, so I'm going to take 20 seconds. I work for Canada Post. Uh, so, uh, my route is I pick up at uh, Bloor and High Park at 5 o'clock every night. And I've asked all my colleagues, they all agree, yeah, there's way more traffic. There's way more traffic on Bloor, there's way more traffic on Annette, there's way more traffic on Dundas. There is no way that we can get west to the West Mall quickly. Um, my, con my question is uh, based on the safe routes to school. Is this is the neighborhood that began the safe routes to school, was the former trustee in this area. Uh, has there been discussion with the schools that the Bloor Street cycle lanes provide some sort of spine for their walking and cycling programs? Thank you for the question, David, and thanks for taking the time to join us. Um, I haven't personally been involved in any direct conversations with the local schools, but I appreciate you flagging that opportunity, and I think it's something worth following up, so we'll take it back. Thank you so much. To my kids, um, the Bloor bike lanes have obviously choked off traffic, and um, commuters are now on all of our secondary roads. Uh, we do not have um, sidewalks in our neighborhood. And, um, we now, I don't know if your data tracks secondary roads or Dundas and Montgomery or what your immediate action plan could be. You give me some detail on what you can do today. Thank you for the question. Once again, I'm going to pass it along to Transportation Services. Monitoring the, um, the increase in traffic on local roads or the increase in speed is something that we are very interested to do because we don't have, uh, we certainly don't want to see a reduced safety for people on the local streets, particularly children and seniors, of which there's a significant amount in this neighborhood. So we have our, our own plan on which streets should be monitored based on, you know, Metavelle is an obvious one because of the, the east-west corridor directly south of, of Bloor, but I know that there are some in the, in the northern section um, as well, and we're interested in your feedback tonight in, in the downstairs portion of there are particular locations you feel should be monitored so that we can identify locations where there are increased speed or traffic and we can look at opportunities for traffic calming of various sorts um, or turn restrictions, but we need to be very balanced about the kind of approaches that we use because we don't want to restrict access to you and your neighbors to get to your homes. Um, we need to make sure that it's, a, it's about improving safety on the street, um, but by maintaining access for local residents. Did, oh, hold on a second. Denise, can you just confirm, are we doing follow-up? Yeah, one follow-up. Okay, yeah. thank you. So I'm trying to be specific because I live 30 seconds away. Can you come down um, tomorrow morning between 8.30 and 9.30 and send maybe a few people, uh, Montgomery and Dundas? It is a disaster. And it has been a disaster since these bike lanes, maybe not solely because of the bike lanes, but living there, I don't need a camera or a, a speed line or anything to tell you, it is out of control. that will allow you to give us lots of detailed feedback on that. And so uh, just to start to think about where you might want to put those things, and those times are very helpful. We could definitely get someone out of Morning Peak at Montgomery and Dundas. We, we, we can make note of that here. Um, but any additional feedback about that? I can't commit that it's going to be tomorrow morning, but in a peak period, we, we're happy to take a look. Thank you so much. We've got two questions from the floor, and then we'll go back up to the upstairs. Hi. Um, my question has a bit of a lead into. My mom um, is a professor at the University of Toronto. She was a scientist at the hospital for sick children. And when she had to choose how to commute, she chose to bike and avoid the traffic, get some exercise. In 2005, she was hit by a road that, uh, on a road that unfortunately now is getting a, a makeover to be a little safer. Um, her leg was folded sideways, she lost a lot of blood. Fortunately, she survived, but for a long time she couldn't walk. Seven cyclists 
this year that have been, have been killed that meant as much to someone as my mom means to me. I know there's a lot of room for modifications, improvements uh, going forward to the Bloor Lanes, but I want to know that concerns about losing a parking spot or two are way less important to the people making those decisions than the safety of the cyclists in the area and everyone else. That is the case, and we do continue to strive to find balance for all road users, especially active road users who are most vulnerable on our streets. Thank you for the question. <coughs> Can I have just a couple points? Question. I am 56 years old. I'm disabled and walk with okay. cane. Okay. When they introduced the bike lane, they would move forward in the past. There has been no parking spaces on the street which allow us as disabled person to park. Yes. With the new bike lane, they took away all the parking space. So I go now to my Princess Margaret for appointment. I can't even stop. Everything is no standing, no standing. What happened? The space we give to bike lane. What can I ask? What happened to us? We have no parking. Okay, I think this is a serious problem for disabled like me. Okay? Second question of all is the negative impact on the residential area. I live in Old Mill area near the restaurant. When the traffic comes here, because it's so congested on Jane and Rural, when traffic coming from the east, they will turn left at the subway station, go to Old go up to uh, what's called now, uh, uh, things, and then my, my street is just like you won't believe the traffic in the morning. Can you just wrap up? Yeah, let's wrap up. 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 Yeah, When you have a dedicated bike lane, people drive who ride a bike are much faster. Now we have motorized bicycle. And you know something? Yes. I got hit nearly at the intersection. At my age, if I fall down, I will have only two more years to go to live. Something about the speed, people are not saying that the majority of bikers are fine. But there are also many bikers, they are not responsible, especially those who deliver people. And let me tell you here, I'm so scared now, walking into architecture across the violin. I'm sorry, because once I fall, I got hit and hit my mouth. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm giving you the queuing and the cut through. The queuing and the congestion at peak periods, we're very aware, we're monitoring very closely and making improvements including traffic signal timing to better flow traffic that just happened this week. So we will continue to see if these efforts are making a difference. The other thing you mentioned about cut through traffic, I appreciate you flagging that specific to the old mill area and that cut through down over to Jane. So that will be something that we take back as well. And I really appreciate you sharing your feedback and your experience. Thank you. We have, um, oh, I was just gonna say that you also asked about parking. And you asked about the changes that were made to parking uh, as part of the complete streets improvement. And one of the reasons, you, that, that's absolutely true, there have been changes that have been made to parking and I think they've had some impact. And uh, we continue to work on adding back more accessible spaces. But there, you know, there, is a, there is a balance. We talk about the safety of all road users. And so there is a question and the gentleman who asked before about uh, whether we balance sort of the need for parking spaces over the need for people on, on bikes and pedestrians to travel, and that is a balance. So it doesn't work for everybody perfectly, but we continue to stay committed to try to add parking back where we can in locations. And I do think the change is quite difficult for people, right? It's, it's something that we need to kind of work through and manage, and that's why we continue to show up in the community and we'll continue to do so. We've got Michelle in the back with a question, and then we'll take two from the floor. 
Uh, my name is uh, Mark. I live in the area. I'm uh, a dad of uh, three kids. They go to uh, Norseman uh, JMS in the neighborhood. I've uh, got to say, the, situa the traffic situation on the floor uh, before the bike lanes, in terms of, from a safety perspective, was completely out of control. Based on the city's own data, cars were, average speed was like 70 kilometers an hour. That is oh. up and down uh, that road. Can so, you just say that last sentence again? You missed the, the audio cut out. So, yeah, just the, even the data that you presented before the complete street was installed, the average speed was 70 kilometers an hour is what we're seeing. Uh, from a safety perspective, that is just completely insane. You have children walking on that street. I've had my own son literally almost got run over by somebody running a red light, and all they did was kind of raise up their hand like, oh, sorry, I don't run over your kid. So from a safety perspective, it is a drastic improvement over what we had before. I'm glad that you got the speed limits down to 50 kilometers an hour. That's a huge improvement. Uh, one of the other benefits is <clears throat> we now have a space where children can actually cycle safely. Uh, my eight-year-old, he's on the bike with me. I've got my three-year-old in the back. Uh, we're able to safely uh, travel through the area. And I'm glad I'm seeing a lot of families, a lot of parents doing the same, also traveling through the area. So I did have one question about safety. Um, some of the intersections are still quite dangerous. I'm looking at Islington, uh, at York, uh, Royal York. Are there any plans to have a protected intersection in these areas uh, to further uh, safety for the pedestrians as well as cyclists? Thank you for the question, Mark. I'm going to pass it to Jacqueline to respond. Uh, if, for those who don't know, a protected intersection provides additional medians and, and space for pedestrians to have the ability to be waiting in an area that drivers can see better, cyclists make turns with um, better sight lines as well. Um, there, are, there aren't currently plans to make any protected intersections um, along this corridor. It does really require a reconstruction to start doing that. It does take quite a bit of space. Um, and it may impact the number of lanes, but it's something that where we do have the opportunity with road reconstructions, um, and we do seek to, uh, to implement those where we can because they do improve safety. Uh, we are making changes in a number of other intersections to slow down turning movements um, so that those can be safer places for people to walk across. There, there's a follow-up. Um, so I guess in lieu of that, um, like some of the areas, there's a lot of pedestrian traffic, like especially uh, near uh, Royal York. So are there any plans to install any kind of automated uh, speed uh, enforcement? Because, yeah, sure, during the, the peak times, yeah, the traffic uh, speeds are down, but off peak, there's still like a lot of speeding that's happening in the area. Yeah, thanks for the question. We do actually have um, at least three automated enforcement cameras per ward that move around. You probably recognize that, and we're actually doubling the number. So we'll start installing new cameras, uh, I believe, in January. And uh, those installations will happen through, uh, through the springtime. So if there are specific locations uh, that you found to be problematic, again, it would be great to know when you go downstairs on, on one of the sticky notes. We'd love to know about that. Thank you so much for, to the panelists for organizing this. Uh, my name is Christopher Yarnell. I'm a father, cyclist, driver, and uh, transit rider who lives in the neighborhood. And I'm also an intensive care unit physician and a motor vehicle trauma researcher. I've cared for pedestrians and, and cyclists who have unfortunately been killed by motor vehicle trauma. Uh, separated bike lanes, uh, although they're demonstrated to make roads safer for pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists, um, you know, and change to those configurations still represents an important opportunity to further improve safety. Uh, my question to the panel is, uh, um, among the changes under consideration by the City of Toronto, uh, how are they going to further improve the safety of Bloor Street West? Um, you know, one of the things that we do when we put it in Complete Street is we know that uh, the traffic patterns and the travel patterns change as a result of that, and a lot of people have described, j just at the beginning, but you know, since we've been working with the community, we've heard a lot about that. Um, and one of the things we do know, we have a pretty robust kit of tools that we can bring to help improve safety in a project like this one. But it does take a little bit of time, and we've had the benefit of some time uh, from 23 to 24 and now 24 forward to make those changes. They've been a little slow in moving forward, and they're happening uh, quickly now. Um, Jacqueline went over a number of them, but some of them have to do with um, 
signal timing improvements that are going to sort of manage the flow of congestion on the main roads and that will have a direct impact on reducing impacts on side streets. Um, certainly managing uh, turning radii so that we have some tighter turns and that uh, the gentleman who was talking about uh, turning vehicles and concerns about speed. And reducing speed is probably the, the best and most important thing that we can do to protect safety for all road users, whether you're driving or you're walking or cycling, regardless of your age or ability. Um, if you get hit, at, and I'm from the US, so you'll forgive me, at over 35 miles an hour, um, it will almost certainly result in injury or fatality, which you probably know. And so bringing speeds down has a huge beneficial effect. And a lot of what we do is to try to manage speeds on these corridors. And even though that usually takes some tweaking in signal timing to make the corridor flow smoothly, um, we feel pretty confident uh, that we can do that effectively. And so we're going to continue to work on that. I just want to acknowledge that I do see hands over here. I've got one over, over here, and then I'm going to jump over on that side. Yes, I'm coming. And then I'm coming to the back. Yes. Just one more follow-up. I just wanted to provide an example of some of this, the improvements to improve safety. So at the at the intersection, of, forgive me, I can't remember the name of it at the moment, but between El Cibio and the Cheesy Place, um, there's been a couple of, um, of collisions at that location. Turning movements um, tend to be quite sharp. Um, so improvements for pedestrian safety, which will improve safety for everyone, are planned at that location with a raised crosswalk and changing from the, the turning. Um, the turning radii, and then obviously the sidewalk gap that I mentioned um, will help improve safety for people walking along the, the south side adjacent to the cemetery, um, east of uh, Prince Edward, and the concrete barriers being the type of protection um, with uh, across the, the bridges will be an important safety improvement as well, because the bollards only do so much. So my name is Yvonne Baker, I'm the member of Parliament for the local center. And I, and I, um, Jim Maloney, the MP for Topical Lakeshore, is away on government business and couldn't be here but asked me to relay that he and I are on the same page. Um, so let me start by saying I'm not ideological with bike lanes. I think bike lanes make sense in some places and they don't make sense in others. I'm also an avid cyclist. I cycle a lot. I cycle a lot and I live just up, used to live up, just up the street, so I cycle in this area a lot. Um, to me, as the objectives of sound transportation planning should be to get as many people to where they want to go as safely, as, uh, as cost effectively, as quickly as possible, by whatever means of transportation they're using, while protecting the environment and, and supporting the local economy. Um, to me, when the city installed, took out the two car lanes to replace them with bike lanes on Bloor Street, the city was not pursuing those objectives. And I think that... Harm in four, there's four key categories where, where I've heard from constituents it's caused the most harm. Uh, the first is it's had you know, a devastating impact on traffic flow with little upside benefit. City data showed about 25,000 trips per day by car on that stretch of floor before the bike lanes went in with 87 bicycles. Um, with, with the bike lanes installed, we've taken over half of the road space. Those 25,000 cars mostly are still there, your data shows that. And even if those 87 bikes roll by 60%, even if they roll by 100%, or 300, I, I see your hand, I'll be quick. Uh, 300%, that's still only 200, 300 bikes to 25,000 cars with a lot of cars. Uh, the second concern I have is I think they risk our safety in emergencies. I've been in caught in congestion there where ambulances, fire trucks, police are trying to get through. I can't imagine who's on the other end of that call, but minutes are being lost, and I've had firefighters and police and ambulance come to me and say, look, this is a big risk, we're worried about it. Um, uh, you know, God forbid someone's house burns down or something worse happens to somebody, like we're concerned about people's lives and safety, and so we should be, we should be concerned about that. Number three is, um, I think they've actually increased emissions. 25,000 cars used to, used to move pretty quickly along there, now they're sitting and idling in traffic, or taking them out. Locally, many of them have been harmed. So my question to you is this, would you do the following three things? Um, move the board bike lanes to uh, to more suitable streets. What to stop they? plans. Well, stop plans. To, to, I said. I, I've only got a minute, and so I'm trying to do my best. Um, the, my question is. 
my, my question is, is would you move the bike lanes to more suitable streets? Number two is, would you stop plans for the extension further west into Etobicoke Center, into the west, or west of the 427 in Markland Wood? And three is, would you, just for future plans, would you just use those objectives that I outlined at the beginning as your guide for transportation policy, whether it's bikes or roads or transit or whatever, and just use evidence to back that up. That, that's my acknowledging you off the top. We are in your ward as well, so really uh, glad to be uh, responding to your question. Um, I'm going to take the first off the top. I'm going to pass it along to our transportation experts uh, to talk about the principles that the city follows when it comes to road design, planning for the incoming growth and development that we're experiencing, etc. And then we're really lucky to have Deputy Chief Jessup with us today, who's been doing a lot of work locally to analyze the impact to our emergency services. We meet regularly to discuss this exact topic for the reasons that you flagged, and so we'll give him an opportunity to respond as well. Um, would we consider moving the bike lanes? At this time, as the local representative, my objective is to continue to work towards improving this infrastructure, and the removal of the bike lanes is not something that I am against. <laughs> So thank you. Um, the last thing I will just say is we understand uh, that the province has expressed an interest in infrastructure in the city, and we do look forward to participating and understanding what the impacts of those that involvement is going to look like. We are always open and continue to be collaborative uh, to the best of our ability. So I'm um, going to pass it to the team. You have pushed us drivers. Sorry, uh, sorry. Thank you so much. Sorry, we've got about 15 minutes left. And, and of course, there's lots of people with lots of questions. And oh, you're right, half an hour, 15 minutes. I'm, I apologize. We do have an hour left. Thank you so much. We'll move on, but we do have half an hour. So just a just a reminder. Well, I'll try to be brief, and I will hand it over to to Jim, um, Deputy Chief Jessup. So. Uh, our principles for effective transportation planning start with safety for all road users and especially prioritizing vulnerable road users. Um, and we certainly want to move as many people through the corridors as we can, uh, as efficiently and effectively. So I, I would say that we share your, uh, your goals and certainly as uh, cost effectively as well. And I, I don't know if you would agree with me, but um, certainly in areas where the land use, like here in Etobicoke, where the land use clearly over decades has supported um, driving, it is a huge transition to try to get as many people through a corridor. We have a great subway that moves most people as, as quickly and effectively as possible. Whatever, travel, travel at some point and you can, we can come back and have that conversation. Uh, we certainly want to make sure that, uh, as we know, um, and just, I can't wait to hear the reaction to this thing, but there's lots of documentation that talks about the support that bikes and people who ride bikes have for local businesses. No. This is so, uh, and, and certainly making sure that uh, people who are old and very young uh, and people who can get around uh, in, in ways that they choose. And then also, if you have to drive for trips, you should be able to drive for them. And I have been out to this neighborhood quite a bit in, in the last little bit of time. I don't live here, I live downtown. I used to live in Dufferin Grove area. Um, but, the, but the streets out here, certainly we've seen a change and an impact. That's why we're monitoring it so closely. It's not, it's not a minute or two minutes or four minutes of congestion, it's above the previous volume, right? So we've seen, uh, th this is a, a local neighborhood road, that an arterial road that has lots of activity. We know that there's gonna be a lot more development and construction in the area, and it's gonna add more people, and we need to give people as many options for safe movement as we can. So those are our goals in when we do complete streets and movement. Thank you for the question. Uh, so as the Deputy Mayor noted, um, we have, Toronto Fire has the ultimate responsibility to make sure that we continue to monitor 
not only this project, but we do this every single day for all projects, all special events, uh, all activities in Canada, uh, you know, a metro-sized city. So uh, I have been working, and my team have been working very closely with the deputy mayor. And in fact, I've just pulled the latest uh, data and what our two key performance indicators that we openly and transparently for the last five years report to city council on four-year award show that your response times have been improving. So, so, I can, so I can tell you that in 2022, the first key performance indicator is what we call effective firefighting force. This is the North American standard that all metro-sized cities follow. Uh, you were at 89%. In 2023, you were at 91, and in 2024, 93. The second key performance indicator is the this. The second key performance indicator that we follow on the North American standard in 20 is the first truck arrival, and that is in 2022 you were at 70 percent, 2023 71, and 2024 71. So we have not seen a decrease based on international standards that we report to City Council on on a yearly basis through our analytics division. All right, remind folks. The panel here before you are all dedicated public servants who are literally doing their work on behalf of the public for the public good. And I have every expectation that we can treat them with the respect that they deserve. Thank you. So to conclude, um, it is important for you all to know that ultimately I am the one responsible. When those 911 calls come in as a deputy of operations for Toronto Fire to make sure that our fire apparatus respond as quickly and efficiently as possible. Uh, we've already made a, a number of recommendations um, to uh, Barbara Gray and to the deputy mayor uh, that will improve, uh, even further improve the response times uh, given um, the, um, the congestion. Uh, and as I said, we do this daily, whether it is a parade, whether it is the future Taylor Swift concert, whether it's FIFA, whether it's the Ontario line. We have commanders, platoon chiefs that literally monitor uh, the placement and the response of our apparatus on a 24-hour basis and we adjust uh, sometimes by the minute depending on the situation that, are, that is happening. So we will continue to monitor, that is my responsibility, I will continue to report publicly and transparently and continue to work with the deputy mayor and all city staff to make sure that you have the fastest response times that the Toronto Fire can provide. Another quick and important note, and we'll move on. I apologize now we're taking a lot of time to address this, this one, but I appreciate again the question and the opportunity. Um, through the change that we are experiencing as a province and certainly as a city, um, and through provincial directives, we have four major transit station, station areas along the corridor of Bloor that are set for intense growth. So status quo thinking is not going to serve us well when we welcome thousands and thousands of new residents into our community. The city has tried to get ahead of this issue by taking away a minimum parking requirement so folks are not incentivized and developers are not incentivized to market to people who need to have a car to move through our community but to consider that we can continue in the way that we have been in our stable communities in Etobicoke, that is no longer our reality. We are growing, we are expanding, we are receiving growth in our community, and we want to do that responsibly and in a good way, and that includes being proactive about the necessary infrastructure to move people through the community without having ongoing impacts to congestions and wait times for the long term. So this is what we're hoping and what we're continuing to drive towards the outcome of temporary pain for long-term gain so we can welcome that growth and density that we don't really have a choice in as we continue to move forward. So thank you again for the question. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Sandra Bynum, actually in Marking Woods. Um, thank you for the segue into my question. 
Um, so I have a question regarding an issue which affects all users in congestion, again, along the Kingsway Corridor. So with the pending large developments on the main Blue Ranch sections of Prince Edward, Montgomery, and the city, what preventative measures are planned to ensure detours and delays due to these construction projects are kept to a minimum? The Jane and Bloor construction that cut the Bloor westbound lane down to one lane is still causing issues. It removed two lanes for one block, one of which was dedicated to bicycles. Thank you for the question, um, Adam, I believe it was. Um, so we do do a lot of work. We have to provide approvals for folks to do lane closures as it relates to construction and the other work in the right-of-way. And my office and my team, we always push back very strongly and try to have folks do as much of the work within the site as possible to minimize the impact to the right-of-way and certainly to ensure that as little additional lane closures are happening as possible, especially while we navigate this difficult time related to congestion in the stretch. But I'll turn it over to Barbara to speak a little bit more about what mitigating measures the city has. So there's been a ton of construction and, and there's going to be more and as the Deputy Mayor pointed out, and much of that is um, mandated provincially we, and, and also something that the city supports substantial uh, growth and affordable and housing for all people so people can afford to live in the city that we love. And con construction uh, is starting to creep into all neighborhoods. We have a number of tools to help manage it. It's very helpful, um, including we have work zone coordinators who are available to address spot uh, issues, and also uh, we do push back pretty heavily on developers in terms of the length and duration and impacts of their closures. That said, there are still impacts to those closures, and uh, if we have information about where you're finding the pain points, um, we also have people who are out in the community who are, who are looking for that, but. Um, it's always helpful to hear uh, where those locations are so we can go out and work with the contractor to try to make changes. I know there's also challenges that, that when people see construction sites, sometimes they are not active and people get very frustrated with that, which I can understand. Sometimes they have people parked in them, which is very frustrating to see because it's slowing you down. And so we have started, again, a series of audits of construction sites where we send our uh, bylaw enforcement officers out on a regular cadence to make sure that we are not uh, wasting any time, that people could be returning those lanes back to traffic or the sidewalks back to pedestrian use uh, when they are done and they just want to store equipment there, which is very frustrating. So those are some of the things that I'd love to know. The locations, because your mic cut out when you were talking about the locations. Oh, sorry, they're, they're mainly uh, the pending uh, condo developments. I get Montgomery, Six Points. Now, now that I'm also timekeeper and traffic director, I didn't realize I was right too. We've got 20 minutes left, uh, and so we've got a wrap up. Time for a couple more rounds. Put your mic up a little bit. Oh, Thank right. you. Anyway, for, yeah, thanks. Thank you. My name is Lee. I'm a 64 year old woman who lives in South Tobacco. I drive a car, I ride a bike, I walk a lot. I have to be transparent here, I'm a huge advocate for complete streets. I think it's a vision of community that is hard for us to imagine right now, given the situation that we live in. Um, I also want to say that for many years I rode around Toronto, and every time I came home, I say to my husband and my kids, I cheated death again. And I still say that, but not as much, because honestly, the bike lanes in Toronto that have been put in the last years have changed my life for the better. Um, Though. I used to live in Bloor West, and I wish that the bike lane along Bloor was there when I lived there because my son probably would have ridden his bike to high school much more than I drove him to high school. Um, I probably would actually come up to Bloor West to use the retail here a lot more, given that I live so close. But the reason that I don't is because I try to use the retail that I can bike to, and I don't feel safe riding on Royal York or Islington. And so my question is actually related to travel times along the work, because I personally wonder if we could get more people like me using the bike lanes along the work in this neighborhood, because I typically stop if I'm coming from downtown or going into downtown, I take uh, the waterfront trail and cover. Um, anyways, um, is part of your plan to reduce the travel time along the work include improving the network off of 
question. So the city uh, had council approves a three-year program of cycling infrastructure improvements across the city to start to, to plan to improve the network. So it is a network-based approach. There's a lot of network analysis that goes into which project should happen when, coupled with understanding where needs are for growth, um, like the intensification that's here, and bundling with road work where we can, because that's where you can get the best uh, type of design of a project when you're when you're changing where the curb line is associated with road work. Um, rural York is a tricky one to make better because the the width is what it is. I mean, for much of it, there's only one lane in each direction, um, and then you start to get into um, north of of Bloor, you have trees and um, and grading issues, and south of Bloor, you've got a lot of, of development very close to the, the corridor. We are looking to improve it. We've made some changes in terms of the, the markings, and there's some areas where you have width to be able to provide some additional uh, protection, but, but that's a tricky one to improve um, specifically. The north-south connections is a, a key part of this plan. This is not about one east-west route across the city. It's about building a network so people can have choices to get where they want to go. And I'll just add the, again, the importance of these opportunities for touch points and us demonstrating a collaborative approach and making improvements to get the travel times down, etc. We understand that it makes it a lot more difficult to see a citywide cycling network realized when we can't demonstrate success. So we know we're not there yet. We hear you. We're crystal clear on that. This is why we're here tonight. And we want to continue to do everything we can to make this work because it has implications. We want the province to be able to welcome with open arms all kinds of infrastructure to support all road users. And again, if we can't get this right, we're not doing ourselves any favors in terms of the connectivity. So I'll just add that and leave it right there. Thank you so much. Here, here, and then over here, and several other hands, yes, I see. Yeah. Um, Michelle, I'm not too sure how many you have up there, but I'm gonna go here first. Hawkins uh, and Central Otoko. Um, contrary to what you just said about bike lanes improving your, your life, I'm going to tell you bike lanes have not improved ours and made it worse. My wife is two false things. She can't ride a bike. We no longer come down here to go to restaurants because there's no place to park. Or if we try to park, we have to park two blocks away, I have to drop her off. It makes the process like 25 minutes to actually get us into the restaurant, right, which should take about two. That is not improved. So I just want to put that comment out. I want to make a couple of real quick things. Data. Your data is not transparent. You talk about analytics and data and transparency. You're not transparent. Yeah. You're not transparent. Okay. The data that about timing of cars, right? If you look at the travel times that it would normally take versus the travel time it is taking, you're doubling travel times. Okay? You're getting percentages of bikes. As we said, they go from 30 to 60, you double, but against 25,000, it doesn't count. It needs to be transparent, it needs to be real. The last thing I say is the bike lanes equal congestion. Okay, and you're keeping those two things apart. You're saying we're going to solve this, but you have bike lanes and you have congestion. I'm all for safety, I deal with risks a lot, I understand that. But the confusion that you're creating for vehicles, in, a, in an area, in Tobacco, that was built on arteries. That's the transportation. We didn't put the Humber where it is. The design was to get certain streets across Humber. But what you're doing is you're clogging. You're clogging Eglinton, you're clogging Bloor, you want to clog Queensway. And yet you want to improve the business in this in the city. How do you improve business when people cannot get downtown effectively? Okay, so you can the work. Thank you for the question, thank you guys for taking the time to join us tonight. I'm going to pass it to the team to speak about the transparency of data, and then I'll make a comment. I would just like to know what you mean by the data is not transparent. <laughs> okay, so I'll just say, um, we, we go to great lengths, and um, we had a conversation the other day in the Crooked Queue, and, and Cody was there, and uh, we're going to, my data lead is out until Monday, so when he's back, we'll um, invite him in to talk about that. But, the data, um, 
you know, is collected by a third party, it's uh, collected by video and a couple of other methods, tube counters and industry standard collection methods. When we publish our dashboards, they, they do include percentages because the percentages are true, but they also include real numbers and you can see the, the discrepancy there. I, I don't think when you see a 200% increase, there's certainly a wow factor, but I, I would also argue that if you look at the numbers, you can make a legitimate estimation about what that growth has been. And so I would say, that there's definitely been growth in cycling in, in this in this area, and there's definitely been additional time delay. Um, the, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be I'm gonna finish what I have to say. Thank you, and then we'll we'll continue on. So I, I do think that the data transparency is really important. We're gonna be working closely with the province on providing the data that they're looking for when they are asking us. We'll find out next week more about that, and we're happy to do it. We're happy to look at different techniques and tactics in terms of data provision. And, and I would also just say that um, they're really, yeah, people talk about bike lanes equally congestion. You know, there, there are some pretty basic rules uh, about um, complete streets. I've probably done 50 to 75 complete streets projects over the course of my career. I'll probably do a bunch more if I'm lucky. We'll see how tonight goes. <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you that um, capacity is managed at the intersection, and that's why we spend so much time trying to deal with intersection throughput. And that's why we make changes to traffic signal timing, and that's why we make tweaks and address issues that are at the intersection. Because over a certain number of vehicles per day, you can lose a lane of traffic, which is not, it's counterintuitive as long as you're managing the intersections effectively. And I would say that the benefits you get back for pedestrian safety and cycling safety uh, are, are, they are manageable, uh, excuse me, they're desirable, and you can actually manage the congestion. And it does take a little bit of time, and it's frustrating, and uh, it makes people impatient, and I totally get that. So we understand it. We're committed to continuing to work through it. Thank you for your question. Hi, my name is Jeff. I live on Jackson Avenue in between Kingsway and King George Road. I've lived there for 25 years with my wife, who is blind. She uses a guide dog. She can no longer cross King George Road at the foot of our street safely, and she can no longer cross Kingsway safely. You've trapped her in her neighborhood. I know you didn't intend to do that. My question is, what can you do to untrap her. Thank you so much, Jeff, for the question, and I really do appreciate it. I'm sorry to hear about the frustration, and just want to um, say that we'd be happy to come out and do a walk through with yourself. Um, and I sorry, I didn't catch if it was your your wife or your daughter, your wife. Um, my mom actually worked in this neighborhood uh, for over 20 years as a community access facilitator for visually impaired adults. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that we absolutely are very mindful of. The goal is to support individuals, especially those who are mar marginalized or vulnerable, road um, you know, navigators or users in, in different ways. And so that is something I see, I think I saw Monica from my team at the back, shout out to you, Monica. If you could come um, get contact information from Jeff and set up some time for us to do a walkthrough um, the area, we'd be very happy to do that with you. And take back any learning. The purpose of the walk is what? To, for you to, you're saying she's trapped and there are some barriers for her to navigate safely. We want to be able to see those in real time and see what changes we can make. Yeah, and it, it sounds like, and we're interested to come out to, to the community with you to, to see and, and, and to speak with your, your wife to find out more about her experience and her lived experience there. But it sounds like it's an issue where there's increased traffic volume and speed that's causing a safety concern. So I will say that Jackson, and King George's Road are on our list of, of locations that we are monitoring actively and we're interested in hearing others. We heard a couple others tonight already. Greenview, um, Edgemore, Meadowvale have come up. Those are locations where looking at the speed and volume and then identifying solutions to ensure that we don't have that level of, of infiltration or speed through traffic calming is something that we are very interested to do because making those local streets safer for everyone is part of our community's objectives as well. And so thank you for raising your concern. Making the streets more accessible is key. Is there a follow up there? Go ahead. Denise, can we take two? Um, you want to go here first? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. And then we'll come back. Okay, great. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll be brief with only questions. Uh, so given the gap between, obviously, drivers that are using the road versus cyclists, I guess this is probably the most difficult question. Uh, one of my uh, three, um, you know, fundamentally as like public servants, should we be catering to such a small minority? That's a difficult uh, question to answer, obviously. Um, the second one is, you mentioned principles for planning is road safety and status quo won't work. So, you know, kind of in that spirit, are we kind of just doubling down on a failed policy? Yes. And wouldn't the bike lanes be better used through residential areas rather than major yes. urban areas? Yes. 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 It should probably be, to be honest, more safe for everybody, both pedestrians, road users, and cyclists. And uh, third, my observation watching a lot of the cyclists come here this evening was not really an adherence to road safety or people who are turning the road. So, you know, you're never picking cyclists or having more stringent rules for breaking the rules that cars have to follow. question. Um, is this infrastructure catering to a minority of road users? I would argue that no, it is not. Yes. Well, the data shows... <laughs> well, the data shows that there, of course, continue to be much less folks driving cars and riding bicycles. The goal here is not to get everybody out of a car. The goal here is to ensure that there are safe alternatives for all road users as our community grows. We heard about the challenges at the bottom of Prince Edward and Bloor, sorry, Montgomery Road and Bloor in our ward. There is a big condo development coming to that corner in case folks haven't been monitoring that. There are many other pieces of construction that are going to bring high density and hundreds and thousands more residents to our community. So this is about thinking wider than just the immediate impacts on the community while those are important and that's what we're here to talk about and address. This is a bigger issue than simply the impact in this moment. This is about building a sustainable city that we can be proud of, we can navigate safely, and that our kids can be happy to inherit and not having to continue with status quo thinking that doesn't always get us very far. to address a couple of things about the number of cyclists um, on new facilities like this one. Um, we have enough experience in installing new facilities on roads to be able to confidently say that the number of cyclists typically grows when people feel confident and safe in the infrastructure. So you will typically see uh, an increase year over year, which is why we monitor it. We've already seen an increase, and to the point that many people have made, is it the most heavily used cycling facility in the city? It's not. There's others downtown that used to have lighter volumes and now have much heavier volumes. We saw uh, post-COVID a huge increase in people cycling because it, people felt uh, with lower or fewer cars on the road that they were safer cycling. and so. When you have safe, connected infrastructure for people cycling, more people will cycle. That's just what we've, what we've learned. Um, and I, I also think that, you know, there's, there's just people who don't necessarily play by the rules regardless of what mode. They're pedestrians who cross against the light, they're drivers who run red lights, uh, and there are cyclists who don't necessarily follow the rules. But I would say the bulk of the people in the city attempt to follow the rules of the road. And so while I agree that you know, there's, there's definitely issues all across the board and they're very frustrating for people, most people I think try to follow rules in Toronto. Thank you. Michelle, you've got one more up there. Um, hold on, hold, yeah, hold on, we have a, we have a follow up. Um, no, I do understand the future growth of the city, but I think a simple yes, no answer for everybody would be pretty helpful in the sense that, you know, would it be safer for the bike paths to be through residential areas versus a major thoroughfare? Wouldn't that improve everybody's safety and efficiency of transportation for everyone? Yes. I mean, we've, we've done, uh, I think we're just three deep on our cycling network plan, and uh, we've identified corridors in the city based on a variety of criteria, which I would really invite you to, to take a look at. And certainly there is space in communities for cycling routes on uh, what would be now known as secondary roads. We're going to learn what that is hopefully next week, but on local roads for sure. 
Um, typically, everybody wants to be in the same place in the city, right? Because that's where the vibrancy is, that's where the businesses are, that's where the transit stops are. And so you'll find that the most direct route through the city is where everybody wants to be. And so we try to balance that. Um, so we have, we have both things, right? We have main road corridors and we also have uh, secondary street corridors as well. Another thing that I can add that we don't have data on today, but we certainly do collect it, is, is the street, complete street conversions make the street safer for everyone. So whether you're walking along the street, or whether you're driving along the street, or whether you're choosing to cycle along the street, the, the, the data shows that over time, the trends will show that there are less driver-to-driver -driver collisions, there are less driver-to-people cycling collisions, and there are less collisions involving people walking. Because there's a, there's a pattern of, of movement along the street that's more calm, it's less frantic, and the speeds are more consistent, and people's uh, behaviors are more um, what you would expect to see. So it's a, it's a smoother uh, experience, and it's a neighborhood street that functions that way. It still carries lots of people, but what you want to see is, is a safer street for everyone. I think that's everybody's objective here. The last thing I'll just add very quickly before we go to the next questioner is that we do actually have very little uh, alternative connect like routes um, that are east-west in this neighborhood the nearest one is Queensway and that's not actually very effective or efficient in terms of a route thank you yeah, four minutes to, oh, Barbara just gave a lot of the details so I won't be late everyone here from you go ahead okay don't worry everyone so just this is our, this is our final question Questions uh, in lots of other ways, and I'll tell you about that in just a second after we've answered this last question. Okay, so thank you very much. So, I have a, a little bit of a unique perspective because, as a city councillor of 2014 to 18, I actually rode my bike from Royal York and Islington, or sorry, from Islington and Radford all the way down to City Hall, and I voted in favor of the bike lane extension over to Rodney. But in that case, they were not taking out lanes of travel. And I did know, as a counselor, as I was riding my bike, that I felt much safer. And I was riding along with many other cyclists. And I've ridden these lanes. But these lanes, frankly, Barbara, Counselor Morley, uh, John. My former boss. These lanes are just not being used. They're, they're, they're empty during the morning rush hour. They're empty during the rush hour. When you want to put in a traffic light, when you want to put in a stop sign, when you want to put in speed humps, they have to meet the warrants. They have to meet criteria. The bike lanes don't have to meet any criteria. I mean, are these bike lanes on board have never been used more than they have today to get people to this to this point. Yeah. So, I do have a question. Have you considered, or would you please consider, Moving the bike lane into one lane on one side of the road as it is done on Lakeshore Boulevard. East, east west traffic flows nicely along Lakeshore Boulevard. It could be done here, but it would require some creative thinking and some engineering. But I would the bike lane is not going to go away, I know that. So I would encourage you to try to make it better and maybe have true east or uh, east west in, on one side of the road. So, thank you, thank you for that suggestion, former counselor. We we do look at different alternatives for the ways that bike lanes can be configured, and and we are very committed to as this project becomes um, in the longer term what the project could look like with a reconstruction. So, looking at a two-way facility is not off the table. However, I will say that. The type of bike lane along a corridor like this is generally not appropriate to be bidirectional because of the number of driveways and intersections and conflict points that that presents for east-west and you'd have to have each of those locations signalized in order to provide for the east-west. The signal phasing would probably mean that it's going to be more delay. So that's all a lot of technical speak to say that it's something that certainly we would consider but typically not appropriate for a quarter of this nature. On the lake shore where it's adjacent to the lake for much of it and very few driveways, that kind of a facility is appropriate. Um, so we are open to looking at uh, alternative designs in the long term and we will certainly seek public feedback through that process when we get there. And we will continue to monitor the number of cyclists in those cycle lanes, which we have seen an increase on. And
appreciate the feedback and question, John. Um, I'm going to give Amber a, a moment to wrap up here. It is 8.17. We are, we are um, uh, after our time. Uh, just for this portion. So there's a whole other hour, um, and there are multiple mechanisms for you to give us your feedback and to give us your thoughts. Um, uh, if, you, uh, if you join us in the cafeteria, there will be uh, uh, folks outside who will help you get there. If you're going to leave, I just uh, ask that you do so quietly so that Amber can uh, wrap up here. Um, there are refreshments downstairs. Uh, there are opportunities for you to write your questions down and also to show us on the map where you have problem points and to talk about some of the suggestions and ideas that might help. Amber, if you would wrap us up. Just to say thank you all so much for your ongoing interest and attention to this project. It really is going to help us make better solutions and get to a better outcome for our community and for our wider city. So thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time. And we look forward to continuing to share your constructive feedback with us. We look forward to continuing to engage in conversations with the province of Ontario uh, and with our community members who are most impacted. So we appreciate you. This will not be the last time you see or hear from us. We've demonstrated from the onset and we'll continue to deepen our work together. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.